Bay and it's great to be able to come together and just sing praises to God and thank you very much for that prayer this morning uh, for God's awesome presence here and for his power uh, in our lives and it's delightful for me to meet a number of I was going to say old friends, some are actually older than I am but uh, you know what I mean from, from the past and uh, it's great to catch up with you today. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. We're going to read a very familiar story. This is from verse 25. You've most probably heard sermons on this dozens of times. Maybe this one is going to be slightly different. Maybe you've heard it before. Verse 25, Luke chapter 10, and I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. I never know what kind of Bible to read from when I go visiting around churches. I know everyone's got a different kind of a Bible, but no matter what version you're reading, you'll get the message. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour is yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbour? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of all his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him for dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. I don't know about you, what this week has been for you. For many it's been a week of tears and of tragedy. And I couldn't help uh, yesterday in reading in the newspaper and listening to the radio about what happened in Arkansas this week, where two young boys, 11 and 13, created havoc in the schoolyard, causing death and despair. And the question that was asked continually, and will be continued to ask for many years to come, why? Why, why did this happen? Such a tragedy. But that's been repeated all around the world in individual lives and in various places. And maybe even in your life this week, there have been times of tragedy, of tears, of problems in your family, extended families. Well, I don't know about that, but God does, and I'm glad that God does, because God says that he knows and he cares and he wants to help. But amidst all the tears and all the tragedy, 
there is also joy and there's redemption. And even, you know, when you look at that little town in Arkansas, the people will eventually come to reconcile that and understand. And there was joy because of what some people did, and there will be redemption. So we go through life with a lot of brokenness. Broken bones, broken bodies, broken hearts, broken promises, broken homes. A lot of brokenness, but I'm glad that in all that brokenness, we can still experience joy. We can still have peace because God is there to bless and to guide. And as we look at this story this morning in just a little detail, there are three questions that I have here. And I've actually titled uh, this sermon this morning, The People Versus the People. A strange title, but you'll understand after a while. And as we look at this story, I want you to see where you fit in. And I've been doing some heart searching, soul searching, myself as I prepared this this week to say where do I fit in to this particular story. So we're going to look at the who but we're also going to look at the what. What these people actually did. And we're going to look at the question why. So I want you to join with me in, in analysing, looking at this story this morning. And to confuse the guys on the sound, I'm going to use this uh, mic because I'm going to be wandering backwards and forwards here. Let me just write on the board here so we get the picture. So here we have the who, the what, and the why. Now actually there are seven people involved in this story. But we're only going to be talking about four of them. There are seven people in the story. Uh, the first one that we come across here are the, the thieves. These are the ones who are laying by the, the side of the road in a place where People often came through and a very narrow pass of the road where it was easy to ambush people. And they were, it, it was a notorious place, well known, and this was a story that was told all around Jerusalem. A distance of about 20 kilometers between Jerusalem and Jericho. And many people walked that road, and at times it was very dangerous. And so here, as this man was going down this road, he was sprung upon by these thieves. Now, what they actually did was to create a problem. So here, the thieves created a problem. They sprung this man, they beat him, they wounded him, they took his possessions, stripped him of his clothing, and left him half dead. Why did they do it? What was the whole purpose of it? Well, as I look at the story, to me, it was because of greed. Because of their basic selfishness, that they wanted to have what this person had. They wanted it for themselves. And so they were motivated by greed. That most probably sprung many others before. But here was a good catch. A man who had had money, fine clothes, and so they stripped him and took all his goods. This happens all the time, doesn't it? And it doesn't happen just with guns and with knives. It can even happen in our own church. It can happen in our own homes. And we can even do it to ourselves. 
Here is a person who's just motivated by greed. Wanting something that someone else has. Wanting to put someone else down. And we can do it with words. And knives can be words that are cruel and are cutting, that are sarcastic, or lies that we tell. And these can break down and they can destroy. And we can have brokenness as a result. And so here, the thieves were the ones who created the problem, caused all this suffering, this anguish, this despair, and because they were motivated by greed. The next person that we notice in the story is the priest. He was a man of the cloth. In fact, he, he had a, a, a cloak around him of uh, uh, protecting himself. Looked good on the outside. And so many of us are like that. What does it say about the, the priest as he came? It says, now by chance a certain priest came down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The priest here ignored the problem. He didn't even stop. Went straight past. Why did he do that? Well, there was a fellow Jew who was one of his own kind, but he was just too proud was because of pride. He was just a little bit better than the man who was lying by the side of the road. Why should he, a man of the cloth, with all this respectability, stoop down to do something to help this man? Basically, it was pride and indifference. He didn't really care, even though he should have cared more than others. And even in our own church, Sometimes there are these people full of pride. And here, pride is the father of all the isms that we have in the world. I'm better than someone else. I'm better than you. Because of who I am, what I do, I'm better than you. And so it breeds parochialism, nationalism, racism, genderism, fanaticism, all these isms are bred because of pride. And sometimes we're even in that situation ourselves. The third person that we come across is a Levite. He was a man of the law, a teacher. He knew the law backwards. He could recite the law. He knew the Torah, everything that was contained there. He knew what Jesus had been saying, or what this other lawyer had said. Very, very clearly, that you should love your neighbour. Do good to those who despise you. And yet, as he came along here, he said, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. He actually stopped. So he was taking an interest here, but he, what he did here, he just observed the problem. Didn't really want to get involved, but he actually did take time to say, yeah, well, there's a problem here. This guy is hurting, he's bleeding, uh, he's almost naked, uh, but I haven't got time. I, I don't want to get involved. There's better things for me to do. Uh, after all, he might uh, be dead. A uh, whole lot of excuses. And the why is because of fear. The fear of being involved. The fear of making a mistake. Just very uncertain. How should I handle this problem? Should I do something about it? And once again, in our own situation, that can often be the motivation that prevents us from stepping in. It's not my place. I don't want to become involved. What if? 
what if something else happens? What if while I'm fixing this problem, something happens to me as well? These same robbers, they may be here to destroy me. I better move on. I better not touch this. And then the fourth person, a certain Samaritan. One who was supposedly an enemy of the Jews. Didn't associate with the Jews, or the Jews didn't associate with the Samaritans. Very, very different. This Samaritan, as he journeyed, when he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, and brought him to the inn, and took care of him. Here was the Samaritan, who came and solved the problem. And why did he do that? What was it that motivated him? Yes, love. Motivated by love. And even though considered an enemy, someone who was opposed to this man, he knew who he was, he knew by his clothing that was left there, that he was a Jew, but he came and he took care. And he went what we call the second mile. He didn't just, you know, bandage him up and drop him off at the hospital. Why, he, he actually looked after him, nurtured him during the night, and then the next day paid for it all and said to the innkeeper, look, I've got to go on, but look after this guy, and uh, when I come back, I'll pay you whatever it's cost, I'll help you out. So we have these four people, each playing a role. Now, at times we are the, the fifth person in this story, the victim. I suppose many times uh, we are the victim, often helpless, not able to do things, not able to defend ourselves. But where do you fit with these other four? As I look at the story, I find that at times I've fitted each one of those. I don't know about you, but there are times when I've been the thief, the robber, when I've done things to people that I shouldn't have done, said things that I shouldn't have said, created problems that shouldn't have been created, caused trouble, stirred up problems. And I hang my head in shame and think, you know, why did I do that? And it was basically because I was wanting to, to get one jump ahead or thinking that what I was doing was right and what others were doing was wrong. And that's how often the problem starts when someone justifies. Here in this story we have the lawyer who is justifying himself in every step he takes. But here every one of these people except the Samaritan justifies their response. Every one of them. And the thieves. They justify their actions. This guy's got more than we've got. Why should he have it? Why shouldn't we have it? I've got needs. Let us fulfill those needs. And so often, even in our own homes, in our own churches, we create those problems because of that. Because we believe that we are right. We've got a certain right to do things. And then sometimes I find that I'm the priest. Ignore the problem. Yes, you know the problem's there, but you hope it will go away without you doing anything about it. And we're all very good at doing that at times. And basically it's saying, I'm indifferent. I don't really care. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get my clothes dirty or my hands dirty. Why should I? I'm just a little bit better. Now, we don't say those things, but that's really what motivates our particular response. And sometimes I'm the Levite. Yes, I know all about the problem. I know what I should do, 
and I observe it and say, well, yes, but it's someone else's duty. I shouldn't get involved here. Uh, if, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. What's going to be the outcome of this? If I, if I do get involved and actually step in, maybe I'm going to get the blame. Maybe I'm going to get in trouble. And there's a lot of goodwill that doesn't happen because people are afraid. Either of the circumstances or the consequences. And so often we hold back from doing good, from doing right, doing the positive, caring because of fear. We don't want to get involved. And then sometimes I'm the Samaritan. I hope that we are all the Samaritan, taking time, even though we are busy, we've got our own things to do, our things to look after, our personal life, our family, that we do step in and that we do care, that we do respond. And it's not motivated by a sense of greed or betterment, but a sense of compassion, of love. Now, of course, this whole story here was represented by Jesus coming down to this earth. He was the one who was the victim, but he was also the Good Samaritan. He is the one who gave up everything and went the second mile as well. And it's this whole story that actually motivates me in my ministry. I'm in the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Health and Healing. And I suppose this story more than anything says to me, Terry, the reason why you are in the work that you do to bring health and healing to people is because you want to solve the problem. You are motivated by compassion. And that's what all Christians should be. People who are interested in reaching out a healing hand to a hurting world. And we live in a hurting world. Even in our own group we are hurting. In our own families we are hurting. We need to reach out to do that. As I look at this story it also tells me something else because what this lawyer said and He's the sixth person in the story, and Jesus, of course, was the seventh. Uh, this uh, teacher, this lawyer said, you know, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And when he gave the response, he was quoting from the, the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, here the whole basis of this was love. This Samaritan wasn't able to do this good deed, this kindness and caring, unless he loved God supremely. And that's what makes all the difference. You can't love your neighbor as yourself unless you've got this connection right. It's got to be a love for God that motivates. Not just a love for yourself, a love for others. That love actually comes from God. And it's completely, supremely. In our program that we, we conduct, which we'll be conducting later this year, we call it the five keys to smarter living. And the five keys are these five things that are mentioned here in these two verses, this lawyer stated them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your emotions, with all your soul, the spiritual, with all your strength, the physical, with all your mind, the mental, and your neighbor as yourself, the social. They are the five keys 
that can make a difference in people's lives. And unless we've got them in the right order, and unless we've got them balanced, we're missing out on life. And this is what the Samaritan had right in his life. He had that love for God supremely. The Levite, the priest, they pretended that they had it, but they didn't really have it. And so often there is a pretense. As uh, Paul says in Timothy, there's a, a form of godliness, but there's no power there. There's no love that gives that power. And so, in our daily lives as we live, let us love supremely with all our emotions, with all our spirituality, with all our physical being, with all our mind, our mental being, and socially as well. I had the privilege in January, the end of January this year, straight after camp actually, I flew from camp uh, back to Sydney the next day went to Cambodia where I was invited to go to do a training program for ADRA and for the government in teaching uh, people how to stop smoking and developing a stop smoking a quit now program for Cambodia. ADRA Cambodia had been granted some money from the Australian government to do smoking control uh, throughout Cambodia. I didn't know anything about Cambodia much, really, except I knew there had been a lot of problems, a lot of fighting, and, and once again, this whole picture came to me. Uh, there, there were people who created the problem, those who ignored it, those who observed it, and those who got in and actually tried to solve the problems there. And I, I witnessed, I saw all of this when I was in Cambodia. I didn't really want to go to Cambodia, because I was so busy with other activities. Uh, I was asked to go, I mean, my way was being paid and all the rest, but I just had so many other things on. I said, well, can you find someone else? And they came back and said, we can't find anyone else. Can you please come? So I decided at the last minute to, to go over there. And I'm very glad that I went. In fact, I called my wife uh, after a few days and said, I think I could stay here forever, you know, in this country. Uh, and those people, it's amazing there when you meet the local people to find out how gentle a people they are and difficult to understand why they had so much of the problem and strife and the killing and the fighting that's even going on and will continue to go on. Very hard to understand that. But what impressed me most and really opened my eyes in that country was what ADRA is doing and what young people involved with ADRA are doing. And there I met most probably 15 to 20 young people working for ADRA, some of them full-time, others volunteers giving their time, their effort, in that country. ADRA actually has about 170 people working for them in Cambodia. They're doing all kinds of projects, irrigation projects, uh, digging, uh, drilling for wells, agricultural uh, projects, medical projects, literacy, uh, developmental projects, a whole list of things right throughout the country. And some young people, just in their early 20s, out in isolated places, very close to where there's fighting, still going on today, risking their lives because they are motivated by love and compassion. And they're really doing some wonderful things there in that country. Monica Spedding, actually, is, uh, I think from Palmerston North originally, just a, a young woman there running the uh, Tobacco Free Project and I worked very closely with Monica and I said, were you afraid last year when they had all this fighting? It was on the, the TV. She said, no, I wanted to actually stay. They were actually evacuated to Thailand. She said, I wanted to stay here uh, and, and help the people. I wasn't afraid. Steve Nerati, 
American who uh, was most probably, I think, 27 years of age, assistant director of ADRA there in Cambodia. Uh, just a, a single fellow, very, very tall. I, I was kind of dwarfed by him. Of course, all the Cambodians, very short, they were dwarfed by him. But it was great to see how he related to the people. He was such a gentle person. And he would bend down, he would stoop down, kneel down, particularly to the kids, and just talk to them. And, and the people just flocked around him. He had a quality about him that I thought, you, know, you don't see this very often. This, it was exuding this, this compassion, this love, just reaching out to people. And it made a difference. People wanted to be there. He went the second mile. He wasn't just willing to do it because he had to do it or because he was paid to do it, but because he, he loved to do it. He, he, in fact, he grew up in the mission field in Taiwan, Hong Kong, served as a uh, volunteer uh, while he was at college doing nursing in Thailand. And he says, I'm coming back. I, I, I want to stay here and, and work with these people. And then there was Sok Pun. Sok Pun was a Cambodian doctor working for the Ministry of Health who actually had been seconded, uh, asked by ADRA to come and work on their tobacco-free project. Uh, he was not a Christian. He was not a Seventh-day Adventist. But he was associating, by this the time I met him, he had been with the project for about six months. And already he was very much involved in the project. He, he was the leader amongst the Cambodians in this project. And it was fascinating to listen to him and to watch him as he participated with all the others in this particular group. We had 25 people, we had uh, a couple of Buddhist monks, we had two Adventist pastors, we had professors from university, from the medical school and the school of education, we had teachers, we had uh, a number of uh, lay representatives, only two of them who were Seventh-day Adventists out of the 25. And as we were planning the program, Sok Pun said, we've got to make sure we bring in the spiritual part of the program, because I told them it was a, a spiritual, physical, mental, social program. He said, we've got to make sure we bring in the spiritual. And he said, I would like to read from the Gospel of John. But he said, some of the people may not understand why we're doing that. So we've got to express it in some other way and get the message across. And afterwards, I asked Steve, I said, why did Sok Pun say that? And he said, well, in our worships every morning, and we have half an hour for worship where everyone in the office comes together in Adra when they're able, we sit down and we're going through different books of the Bible, and at the moment we're going through the book of John. And we're just reading it verse by verse and looking at it and saying, what does this say to us today? And Sok Pun, who was not a Christian, who was not an Adventist, was joining in and taking this in, drinking it in, and saying, we need to share this with others, this story about Jesus and how he can help people and so on. And I was just amazed that this was happening. In fact, Steve was telling me, he said, we have people here that come in and just work with us for a few months. Once a project's finished and then they go off contract, he said, but they keep coming back to our worships in the morning because they enjoyed it so much. It made a difference. And as, as I looked at that whole crowd there, that, those Andrew people, these young people, and I was just challenged and inspired again you know, what people can do to make a difference in the world when you are motivated by love and compassion. And that only comes from God. It doesn't come from within, it comes from God. And in this whole ministry of health and healing, first of all we need to start with ourselves. Don't cheat on yourself. Don't rob yourself by the way you look after yourself, by the things that you do to your body, in what you eat and what you drink and other things. Take care of your body. But 
then go beyond that in terms of the ministry of healing and reaching out. Not just looking and observing, but actually reaching out and touching someone and making a difference in their lives. I hope this week that all of us, because we're motivated by the love that God has for us, will be problem solved.